This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Um, I'm calling to order this meeting at 7.36 p.m. Um, I will take a roll call attendance. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. Mr. Demling. Demling present. And Ms. Donald present. Ms. Hall. All right, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 7.36 p.m. And we'll also start with a roll call attendance. Mr. Menino. Menino here, uh, present. Um, Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Barlow. Barlow present. And Ms. Stancer. Answer present. Great. And Hall present. The minutes, the only minutes that we're ready for tonight, I shouldn't say only, we've had a lot of meetings. So thank you, Miss. Thank you, CLO. That was, uh, uh, we appreciate your service and these meetings have been quite lengthy, but um, we're Amherst and Pelham minutes, only minutes from August 6th. Um, I know they've been, the others have been coming in um, through Ms. Figaro from CLO. So thank you, CLO. But um, those are the ones, so they're, they're not joint meetings. They are, um, they're specifically uh, a meeting on the 6th with which the Amherst School Committee and then one that was the Pelham School Committee. Sorry. Um, That's there. I have, yeah. I have a minor correction for the Pelham minutes. It's in section 3A. And um, the word continent should be, I think, contingent. And I had an edit for the, for the um, Amherst minutes on the first page where it says, Ms. Spitzer asked a question about opportunities for outdoor, outdoor learning, given that all students will be back. It should have, it should have read that um, at that moment, I think it was like, not all students will be back because it was part of that phased in approach. Um, so I would just add the word not. Yeah, there. Edit. Mr. Demling. Mr. Demling. Um, August 6th, 2020. Second. Second. Governor Demling. Uh, Demling, I. Karen, can I? Mr. Harrington. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Spitzer. And McDonald, aye. Minutes are approved, five to zero. Okay, are there, thank you. Are Sorry. any other comments or edits to the Pelham minutes from August 6th? No, oh, yep, go ahead, Ms. Barlow. Yes, um, on the part where it says, Ms. Barlow said that the staff worked hard on this program. I believe it's in um, section three in the third paragraph down. Just there's some wordsmithing um, and how they would be employed. I think it was asked if they would be employed. Okay. Thank you. All right, anything else on the Pella Minutes? 
All right, um, I'll move to approve the uh, Pelham School Committee minutes from August 6th. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Kenny. All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Okay, thank you. Now um, we're going to move to public comment. Um, and because of my um, dicey Wi-Fi, um, I've asked Ms. Hall to, um, if she could help um, by playing the, the, the voice recordings that we've received. Um, I will note, um, I sent um, the PDF of the public comment to everybody on the committee um, earlier this afternoon. Um, and also it is already posted on the website and we do have um, approximately 30 minutes of voice message um, public comment. So we'll start with those. Um, and like I said, because of my spotty Wi-Fi, I've asked Ms. Hall to help. Is it, is it still spotty or can folks hear me? Yeah. Should I can hear okay. Would you like me to try playing from here or are you, do you feel all set Ms. Hall? Oh, I'm I, I'm happy to do it. I don't mind. Okay, why don't you uh, why don't you go forward with that? <laughs> okay, all right. Here we go. Hello, my name is Jenny Hamilton. I'm an Amherst resident and a Crocker Farm parent, and I am calling to support um, in-person learning as soon as possible in this school year. Um, I'm grateful that you all are relying on public health measures to follow that planning. Um, our virus numbers are currently low because people in our area are taking this threat seriously and the social emotional health impacts on our students and their learning are significant. I appreciate the difficulty of the decision and the situation you all are in because there are truly no good choices right now. So I think looking at the areas where the least harm is being done, um, and particularly keeping in mind the needs of families with the fewest resources and kids with the most complicated learning needs um, is where the priorities need to be. So thank you for your leadership. Hi, my name is Kristen Famagetti, Pelham, Massachusetts. I'm a mom in the district with a first and second grader. We opted for in-person learning because we felt it was the best choice for our family. And after completing a very difficult and straining three plus months of kindergarten and first grade remotely, while balancing both of our work schedules with no family to help or childcare options and facilitating remote learning, we chose in-person learning for this fall. I have to add a side note here that the Pelham School and our teachers were above and beyond amazing during this time and really understood how to make an impact and connection with the students in the remote environment. However, even with these parameters, it was still a challenge. We became hopeful when the district prioritized in-person learning in a way that was thoughtful and science-based. We understand that there are no perfect answers here and we struggled upon learning that the ATEA was proposing a drastically different plan in the district because we care immensely for our teachers and respect the inclusion and necessity of their voices. Our hope is that by continuing to work together, a reasonable plan will be put in place by the school committee and the ATEA. And while we hope this will include in-person time for our kids, we understand if it does not. My reason for public comment today is to point out one aspect I'm sure you're all aware of, but it's worth highlighting. There are numerous parents who, like myself, filled out the survey and indicated remote or in-person, but are heavily considering pulling their kids out and going another route if the elementary age students' remote schedule stands as it is. There are plenty of resources being shared on different learning pods, homeschooling, and more. There are many reasons for the widespread interest in finding a reasonable solution for elementary education this year. And of course, each family has different reasons for pursuing education outside of the district different support structures, varying financial situations, but the 
common theme is that the remote learning schedule proposed is simply not reasonable for young children and families. In a household with two working parents and absolutely no outside child care or family to support us, we would be forced to choose between keeping our jobs and our kids' education. We want to highlight and make sure that the district is taking into consideration the funds that will be lost due to families seeking a reasonable educational experience for their kids. In a world of so many unknowns, we absolutely know that this schedule will not work for our families, as many other working families have highlighted. It will not work for them. We urge you to be realistic on the proposed remote elementary school schedule. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Moss, and I'm a teacher at Wildwood Elementary School, and I live in Shrewsbury, Mass. And I was just calling with some questions about specifics on if we do return into person, what's the plan for if a teacher gets sick? What's the protocol for students if they come in on a bus with another student who has been identified as having COVID? Um, we are asking for very specific, detailed protocols, and my concern is we're not getting the answers that we need in order to return to school safely. Wildwood classrooms and classrooms have no access to hot water. How are we supposed to help keep the children safe? if we don't have the very basics of what we need. So the concern that I would like highlighted is our buildings are not yet safe. We want to teach our children. We want to be with our children in STEM. But above all, we need everybody to be safe. Science should be driving these decisions, not desires and wants. At this point, public health really needs to be the top priority. And teachers should not be feeling like we're being forced into an unsafe situation, which will then in turn transition to create a very different classroom environment for students. So please, I beg you to reconsider putting students and staff in buildings that are not yet safe. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, my name is Christine Pilsner. I live in Amherst, and I'm the parent of two children, a first grader, an injury first grader, and entering fourth grader at Wildwood. Um, I do thank the efforts of all the educators for um, trying to operate in this incredibly challenging time for everybody. Um, and I eagerly await more details as we grow closer to the start of online classes, and then hopefully as we reach the point for in-person classes. My one um, request is around how online learning will be served up for our children. Um, as, a, as a working parent, and I'm married to another working parent, um, it is, uh, we're trying to make a priority of our students' education, and we acknowledge that that will require some uh, sacrifice and flexibility on our part with our professional career um, in this economy that is no small uh, and it is certainly an area of tremendous anxiety. Um, however, I'm willing to do it. But my request is that there is a very clearly laid out, um, consistent methodology for learning so that I can schedule my work days around assisting my children with getting online so that I can be clear about what their assignments are um, and that these things are communicated clearly and consistently. My dream would be to be able to, you know, on a Sunday night that I know what to expect for the next five days. I completely understand that this last spring was an anomaly and that all of our educators were scrambling um, in the midst of a forced emergency that required us to go to remote learning. Um, however, I'm really hoping this can put our foot forward so that um, we can best organize our lives to support our children's education. Again, this is Christine Posner, um, resident of Amherst and parent of two child, two wildwood children. Thank you. Bye-bye. My name is Amy Kravitz. I'm calling to make a comment about um, the upcoming school situation. I have a son in Wildwood Elementary School entering first grade. I strongly support the opening of school as soon as possible. Um, I do feel that any later than October 1st would be problematic for the young children. Um, I do not imagine that my six-year-old will be able to successfully 
um, complete um, daily remote learning um, at a screen all day um, and without a teacher physically present in the room with him. Um, I also am in a family where both parents are working out of the home um, and it's putting a huge um, financial burden on us to find alternative care for a child um, with not only care but someone to do school with him um, during the day. Um, so again, I strongly support opening of the schools as soon as possible. Thank you. Hi, I am Heather Sheldon on behalf of the board of the Amherst Pelham Special Education Parent Advisory Council. The announcement of the additional two-week delay to the start of in-person learning for all district students, regardless of individual education plans that call for services that can only be meaningfully delivered in person, is greatly disheartening. This delay has serious implications for many of our families who are striving toward the September 16th start date. Virtual learning means no learning for a great many of the students designated to be in phase one. We have heard union leaders ask for creative solutions, and we want to make sure that the use of our buildings remain on the list of creative solutions. Much effort has been put into making our buildings more robust to the virus, and teachers can control their environment and resources in ways they cannot if asked to provide services in the community or in home. Schools remain a safe haven for many of our students, and there are significant barriers to providing instruction elsewhere that very well could impact whether a student gets services at all. The union appears to be pushing for no in-person instruction for the foreseeable future. While our comments above are centered on students with significant disabilities, we know that students have a broad spectrum of abilities and all learn in different ways. Just as robust, robust remote learning must be an option this year, in-person learning needs to be an option for all of our students as well to the greatest extent possible. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Goff. I'm a resident of Amherst and the parents of two children in the Amherst Regional Public Schools. I'm also a public health professor, MTA member, and a general pediatrician and internist. I first want to thank our school committee teachers, staff, and administrators for their hard work in trying to meet the many and varied needs of the public school constituency. I'm calling with a comment regarding the conditions the APEA appears to be insisting upon for any form of return to in-person instruction as outlined in the school committee's August 18th statement. Demands listed in this statement, such as the requirement that there be fewer than one out of 100,000 new cases per week in a five-county region, are not grounded in current data or science. Although I fully understand as an educator and a healthcare professional that COVID can be and is scary and that there are still unknowns the virus is much better understood than when we first went into lockdown more than five months ago. It's critical to use the best, most recent data, science, and reason to guide decisions about return to school, not fear. Contrary to the APA's assertion that students' needs can be met with online learning, a growing body of evidence is showing how ineffective it is compared to in-person learning and potentially harmful, particularly for students who have the greatest educational needs. The evidence for deleterious effects of remote learning on mental health and other health indicators such as exposure to adverse childhood experiences which have lifelong negative effects on education and health are mounting. This is a difficult situation with no easy answers, but I implore the school committee to resist the pressure to make decisions based largely on fear and to work with the AP APEA to use the best data and science-driven guidelines available to make decisions about return to school, mitigating risk, and keeping teachers and staff and students safe. We've had five months to prepare for this. I deeply respect and want to protect teachers and staff, but the APA's proposals disproportionately and unnecessarily place the risk on children who do not have a union to represent them. Thank you. My name is Nick Spire. I am an Amherst resident and a Fort River parent. Our family wholly supports the district's stance that getting the youngest learners in the building is of critical importance because there is no such thing as an effective remote learning from experience, it just doesn't work. These are critical years for social-emotional development, building learning skills, and building confidence, and these kids have already been out for almost six months. We agree with the district's stance that returning them to successful learning is a moral obligation. We have also been encouraged by the use of the best available information to public health guidance to craft a conservative plan that is based on established public health metrics and takes all reasonable measures to keep students, teachers, and staff safe while prioritizing effective education. The classroom environments being prepared are far safer than so many other working environments where so many people have been working for the duration of this pandemic. We're 
grocery store workers are encountering far more people with far fewer protective measures than the kindergarten teachers will, but they take precautions and go about their business and have managed to do so by and large safely throughout this whole pandemic. They have families. They have children in this district, and they are masking up and doing their part to support this community. They are but one example. The list of professions that have continued working with reasonable pre precautions without poor outcomes is long. Virus transmission is very low in our community. Statewide numbers are low and falling. UMass has rolled out one of the most aggressive testing programs in the country and has found an extremely small number of cases. There have been some scary headlines from around the country, but we are not in an area with high virus transmission and the plans put forth for reopening are anything but cavalier. We must run our school system on information and not fear and hyperbole. We were extremely disappointed to see a thoughtful reopening plan replaced with a vague, wishy-washy statement with no defined metrics to inform decisions. That does not represent the kind of data-driven decision-making we have come to expect from the committee and the district. The demands of the APEA to be entirely remote until February are unreasonable, disregard the well-being of our students. It is shameful to say that kids cannot go back to school in person at all, while every elementary school in this district has sufficient outdoor space to hold the class outside. It's time to get creative and figure it out. The school district exists to serve students, not their teachers. I encourage the school committee, the district staff, and the APEA to keep that fact at top of mind when coming to a decision on what to do this fall. And please, let our kids Hello, my name is Tina Furcolo. I live in Amherst. I did submit an email to the committee, but I wanted to leave a voice memo of highlights of that email. I have two daughters in the Amherst system, ninth and 10th graders. I'm also a physician in the community who's worked tirelessly over the past five months to care for, test, and educate my parents, patients about COVID-19. I've been extremely frustrated with the lack of information from Amherst school system about fall plans. What little I have learned, I've learned from various emails about news about the metrics to be used for determining when it's safe for schools to reopen and advance their model over the school year. These metrics are far more stringent than other school systems throughout Massachusetts. Particularly our towns, Amherst, Leverett, and Pelham, and Shrewsbury, have COVID statistics right now that other states would like to achieve to be able to reopen. What is particularly concerning is the metric for phasing in, which says less than 33% increase from prior week's data on both metrics, even if the results are below the cutoff. This all but guarantees that our high school students will be denied any in-person instruction of any kind during the upcoming school year. We must use metrics that are not extreme outliers and reflect the science and wisdom we've learned over these past five months. As a medical professional in the area, I'm insulted that the Amherst Regional Public School System, School Committee, Teachers Union, do not have faith in our students, our families, and our health care system to test, isolate, and contact trace to make sure early COVID is detected and identified in our community. We have the testing capacity. Governor Baker has pledged more testing to schools with positive cases identified within their schools. We have proven that our educational efforts have worked and that community members know how to keep themselves and others safe from COVID. We have done a great job as a community. Our students deserve the same access to meaningful education as other students throughout our state who are reopening with hybrid systems within the next two weeks. Two weeks. There's growing frustration within our community of parents and caregivers. We highly value education. And we know that without high-level, excellent, and meaningful education, our children will fall behind, not to mention feel more isolated, unmotivated, and depressed. Hi, this is Mary Clays. I'm calling in. I have submitted a very lengthy uh, public comment. So if anyone wants time to read it, you can email me at the uh, ARP. You 
United, A R P S United at gmail.com. It's very hard to see all the public comments, but there should be some public comments from individuals who would like to see more in person returning to school uh, this fall with proper safe, safety guidelines. So um, rather than read the letter, I am referring you to feel free to email me if you have any other questions. We support teachers, we support unions, or I, I should say I do. I'm speaking on behalf of a group of parents who would like to see the safe return for our students to school with proper measures. If you have any questions, you can email me at the ARPS United at gmail.com, and it has no affiliation with the school or PDOs. Um, and uh, that one got cut off, but that's all there was. Um, so I will go to the next one. Hi, my name is Kelly Correa. I live in Emmers. And my comment is to please have this, the teachers consider in person learning with all the safety and matters that we can take. It. Um, my two kids go to Croquetown and they are having a hard time staying home. Um, and at this point, in person learning is possible and safe according to the data and uh, from all the CDC guidelines. We can still do this with the help from the, 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 the community, the families, I'm willing to volunteer, and together we can do this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Stephanie Hockman. I'm a resident of Pelham and a parent of an eighth grader and ninth grader. I would like the school board and the APAE to collaborate and work with its other constituents, students and parents, to get everyone back to learning live instruction, in person and eventually remotely if it's warranted in the winter. Parents, including myself, my husband, and many others that we've talked to, will volunteer and support teachers and staff. We can help set up tents for outdoor learning. We can ride buses to check temperatures and make sure riders have masks and sit six feet apart. We can stand outside school buildings and check temperatures. We can monitor hallways for wearing masks and social distancing compliance. We can make sure each student sanitizes their hands before entering the building and entering every classroom. We can proctor classrooms for teachers who are instructing synchronously from home due to their age or being immunocompromised. We are an educated and innovative community that can find creative solutions to make the in-person live instruction work so that our students don't fall farther behind. Please collaborate and have our students' best interests at heart. We can be safe and responsible. Our numbers in the community and the low transmission rate prove that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matthew Markman. I'm a ninth grader. Now, the test and assignments don't always come easily to me, but the questions I ask my teachers, I need to ask them or I can't really complete the work. Last spring, I was enjoying my second year of Latin, learning geometry, and learning amazing new concept, concepts in English, science, social studies, and math. I can always, honestly say I enjoyed learning in my classes for my teachers. However, when COVID hit, one's learning was severely diminished. I wasn't learning new material, and I missed the live interactions with teachers in person. I've spent the last five months being very diligent about my interactions. I miss my friends, my coaches, and my teachers. I want everybody to be safe and be responsible, but I do want to be in the class learning like 70% of Massachusetts schools. Here in the Amherst community, we have some of the lowest infection rates in the state, and I strongly believe that we can do our best to keep everybody from getting infected. Please find a way to help me continue to learn in the classroom, or at least through live instruction. Don't let the fear of students not being able to follow the rules keep you from teaching. We will do our part. I hope the school board, the administration, and the teachers will do their best to help me become the college student I strive to be. Hello, my name is Gina Kaufman, and I live in Amherst. I would like to share comments 
from me and my husband, Miguel Ringler. We are both members of the MTA, Massachusetts Teachers Association, and we are parents of a special education student at Fort River in Amherst. We are very concerned about the decision to have all students start remotely in September. We want the return to school to be as safe as reasonably possible. However, we feel strongly that the needs of special education students are not being adequately considered with the change of a virtual start for all. While we have the means to hire an in-person tutor for our daughter, others do not. We know from this past spring that our daughter cannot learn online for more than 90 minutes per day, and that is with one-on-one -on -one instruction. The longer we delay in-person learning, she and other special education students are going to fall even further behind. We implore the MTA to find a way to bring back special education students and kids in shelters, foster care, and food insecure families as soon as possible. With our experience adopting our daughter from foster care, we know how vulnerable this population is. We ask the school committee to please make every effort to stop the widening of the achievement gap for our most vulnerable students by beginning in-person classes for them on October 1st. Thank you for listening. Gina Kaufman. My number is 413-548-6309. Um, okay, and then this is the, the final voice recording. My name is Sophie Hyam. I'm in 10th grade at Amherst Regional High School, and I'm leaving this as a public comment from the school committee meeting on August 25th. I have sacrificed playing basketball, seeing friends, and traveling over these past six months. High school is a time where people find their identity, find new friends, and discover what they love. I understand the fear and caution that people have, but if we follow the right protocols, I believe we should have one to two days a week at school. A lot of things have happened over these past few months, and conversations over Zoom will not have the same effect as they do in person. As a student, I believe that people are not going to speak up on Zoom, when in school, I know that more people would be more comfortable to state their views and opinions. I know that students are willing to abide by the rules and protocols, and if we don't even think about going hybrid until November, I'm scared we might not go back for the rest of the year. Thank you. Okay, that was the last of the recorded comment. Uh, Dr. Morris, were you going to do the emailed comment? I actually have one more um, voice recording that did not come in through the phone number, it came in through email. So I will try playing that right now. Okay. Dear school committee, school staff and neighbors, I'm speaking today to advocate for in-person learning for all of our children starting September, five days a week for children who need it and at least two days a week for middle and high school. Families and staff should have the choice to do what's best for them. I know that some families are planning to have their children stay home and that some school staff also need to work from home. And as a myself, I very much support them. This is not the best option for many children. Decisions are being made matter. Not enough careful consideration of the risk of school like the risk of not being in school. Where people come down on this varies widely in our community. I ask simply that you keep an open mind and make decisions based on facts and concrete metrics. Remember that what I and other families are asking for is not for everyone to have to to school. Everyone have the option to do so and can make the choice that's best for their children and families. Why have I decided myself that risks are low enough for my own three children to go to school? Well, there are just a handful of COVID cases in the ARPS towns. Thus, there were nine active COVID cases total in Shutesbury, Pelham, Leverett, and Amherst out of well over 40,000 people. 
Hampshire County has only 37 cases per 100,000 people, and the percent positivity test rate for the last 14 days is 1.10% for the county. We can't eliminate all risk, but in view of the numbers and the extensive safety measures that schools have ready, I strongly believe children should have the option to go to school until the metrics change. Everyone I talk to about this issue gets the academic, social, emotional, and even physical safety benefits of being in the school building. I've seen the lack of it in my own children, and I'm worried about the long-term effects of missing yet more time they can't get back. And we also have to remember that COVID may surge again. I don't know what will happen in the fall, but if COVID rates rise and schools have to go fully remote, we could be looking at being out of school for months. For those of us with 12th, excuse me, 4th through 12th grade students, Model 4 doesn't start those kids in school until November, and I don't want to see my kids possibly not being in school at all this year. I know this might sound alarmist, but I do think it's a real possibility. Having something like two days a week in school now would give kids a chance to form relationships with teachers and get the socialization they need. There are many significant risks for being kids being out of school, and just as I balance the risk of getting in a car accident while driving, I have the I know we're all in different places difficult as you families and look forward to more these these early ways benefit except the four. But here there are many cameras. I think Ms. McDonald, I don't think we're able to hear you very clearly at the moment. I'm sorry. So um, at least I can't make out what you're um, what you're saying. Um, I don't know. I'm going to hand the names over to Ms. Ball to share the rest of the you got it. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Morris, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen to do the um, the written public comment. Yep. Thank you. Is that relatively visible, folks? Okay. Yep. I haven't done this for a couple of meetings, so if I go too slow or too fast, someone's going to let me know.
Pacing working okay for folks? Okay. So I just want to comment. I know I've got um, some people texting me that um, the comments are clear on channel 15, but people who are live streaming, it's less clear. Um, the comments are on our website. So if you go to our website and click on the school committee tab in today's meeting, the public comments are all there. So if you are viewing and struggling to make sense or tr struggling to read because it's blurry, um, the, this full document is, is on the website right now.
That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, next up is the superintendent's update. Okay, um, so um, I think I will be rather brief because much of my updates would go into item 9C, fall 2020 update. Um, but I have a couple of things I'd like to share. Uh, one is, um, and I got to see this live uh, on Saturday, which is there's mobile space, mobile classrooms, so to speak. They haven't been used in many years behind Summit Academy at the high school building. And it's been a, talked about for many years, probably Mr. Sullivan, longest serving member can remember when he first got on and, and they were uh, removed on Saturday. So thanks to all of our facilities department for doing all that prep work. Uh, for, for the committee for being involved in the capital planning for that. It's really opened up the outdoor space behind Summit Academy, which was one of our long-term goals when the school moved there uh, around green space. Um, it, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, I, went, I saw the before and after as well as the during, and it was very neat. So you know, I just want to thank everyone, both the committee for financially uh, advocating for that, but also for all the staff who put in um, time in a very hot summer, uh, getting that all prepped uh, and ready to go. Similarly, uh, last uh, done by this week will be the last of the Wildwood exterior door project. Um, so those of you who have been on the Amherst School Committee a while know that this exterior door project um, has been, I think it's happened over, over well, I know it's happened over several years um, and we're, we're getting towards uh, conclusion. So that also uh, feels really good. Um, and I think the last update that's not about the fall um, is that we just found out today that the middle school Vela program, which is our after school program, uh, was uh, named ex ex exemplary uh, by the licensing agency. And, um, and so that's a partnership with us and the Collaborative for Educational Services. Um, so at the state level, it was named exemplary, which means that grant continues, which is great news for our students and our staff uh, and for the middle school and for the collaborative. And we appreciate our partnership with the collaborative on providing high quality um, out of school time work, um, out of school time um, opportunities for our students. So um, just a couple good news things to share. Again, I'll, I'll share more expansively on uh, fall 2020 update when it's on the agenda item, uh, when, it, when we're on that agenda item a little later in the evening. Okay, great, thank you. Well, we'll be back to you. Um, all right, chairs updates. I do not have an update, Ms. McDonald, I'm assuming probably not tonight for you. Not tonight, thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right, school committee announcements. Any committee members have announcements? Yes, Ms. Lord. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to invite everyone to the school equity task force meeting on September 9th, 630. Thanks. All right, terrific, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, great. Um, all right, so under new and continuing business, the next item is the food service and USDA waiver. So Dr. Morris, I'll go back to you. Yeah, I'll prompt us. I wanna welcome uh, Michael Gallo O'Connell, our nutrition director is joining us tonight um, so you can share more information. This has been talked about a couple times in meetings this summer. Um, I think in the agenda packet, um, if those of you have it up or if you're watching online uh, on pages looks like six and seven uh, was to me a disconcerting letter that was written last week um, by Sonny Perdue, who is the secretary of the Department of Agriculture. And there's a lot of legalese in there, but essentially, uh, and, and Mr. Gallo O'Connell can talk about this in more detail, it, it doesn't allow for our summer food program, which uh, we started in the spring. So it allowed for um, 15, 14, something like that, uh, Mr. Gallo O'Connell will correct me, um, food sites within our community to have drop-offs without, um, that was truly drop-offs. It wasn't checking for who the student was or anything like that. Um, so it's very disappointing because that's been highly successful. We've served, you know, literally thousands of meals um, through the spring and summer. We did get an extension to cover the first two weeks given the later start, um, first two weeks of September. But, but as once school starts, um, we are not able to continue to do that in the current model. And so it's very disappointing. So I think uh, Michael's going to share a little bit about where we are, you know, what we've done, uh, what are some potential options. Uh, I'll talk about a new option that we're starting to explore 
um, and then he can put a finer point on it. And you know, I think then we'll take some questions. But you know, food scarcity has never been a larger issue, I think, than it is right now. It will continue to be a large issue in the fall. And so uh, we are doing our best to try to come up with creative solutions to make sure that we can get uh, food for our families. We hear from them all the time in terms of Michael and Dr. Marta Guevara, who's centrally involved in this work as well in terms of the outreach, uh, how critical that has been for families. Um, so I really want to thank Michael and his staff for their incredible work. I mean, I think we started up the second day that we were closed in March. I think it was like the 17th our food service started uh, and expanded. I also want to publicly thank our UMass partners for, for being a huge, huge help with us. But with all that introduction, Mr. Gallo O'Connell, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. So I would also like to um, begin by just recognizing like the hard work um, of the food service staff and the um, the volunteers that have made like it possible for us to operate um, all the fifteen or all the uh, the meal sites that we've been doing, um, and the family center and their help coordinating with the community, helping us find you know people that need the meals. Um, so yeah, I'm, just, I'm really grateful for uh, for all their help. Um, so I'll guess I'll begin with a brief history. Um, so as Mike said, uh, we're operating under the uh, summer food program right now. Uh, it's a federally funded program, which allows us to um, serve free meals um, during the summer. And like Mike said, we don't have to track who's taking the meals. Anyone who's 18 and under um, can take the meals. Um, and it's been really successful. Um, you know, we, since school closed, we have um, been able to um, provide over 40,000 meals. Um, UMass has been helping us feed um, a number of our sites and they've provided meals for about 60,000 people. So together, it's about 100,000 meals um, that we've been able to get out uh, to people in the community that needed them. So yeah, I'm really proud of everyone uh, all the hard work they've done to make that happen. Um, so we've been operating a number of meal sites um, with uh, the help of some waivers from the USDA. Uh, and those waivers, like, like Mike mentioned, uh, Senate Purdue's letter. Um, so there was some hope that they would continue the summer food program for the 2021 school year. Um, which would allow us to continue operating um, like between UMass and us, it's 15 sites throughout town. Um, they, um, and in the letter, I mean, it, it, it says that they don't have, uh, they require Congress to provide funding for that, I think basically is what they're saying. So, um, so that's not happening. I mean, we still, there's a possibility um, that there might be a uh, universal free lunch um, funded in uh, the next um, the next bill, but that's still up in there as well. Uh, so right now uh, we've been providing meals um, for seven days a week. It's been Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, deliveries. Uh, we provide hot meals on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, cold meals for the other days. Um, so it's breakfast and lunch. Um, we've reason the high school is the one kitchen we're using right now is a commissary kitchen. Um, and we, um, transportation providing drivers and vans. So right now we are using two drivers, two vans, um, to reach all the sites. Um, volunteers are running the sites for us. So each site, um, it's a pretty quick transaction. So each site is over for about 15 to 20 minutes to try and limit the amount of exposure um, to the volunteers and people in the community um, to each other. So, so they drop off the meals, um, they make their other stops and they come back and pick up the, uh, the totes um, after about 15 minutes. Um, and any uh, leftovers that we have that we can't use, uh, we bring them to either the, uh, the survival center or to uh, Craig's door. Um, and um, so yeah, um, 
like UMass helping us initially was like very was really critical. Um, we uh, like right when school closed, we didn't know what our demand was going to be. We have 900 free and reduced um, eligible students, so you know it was going to be. We thought somewhere around that number of kids is what we're going to have to try and feed. So. Um, you know, we uh, had a limited staff in the beginning. People were like concerned about, you know, coming into work and, you know, things are kind of normalized a little bit more now, but, you know, there's still a lot of concern um, from people that will be returning uh, to work in the fall. Um, so, Mike mentioned the, the summer food program has been extended until the, the, um, the start of the school year. So it's November or September 16th. And then after that, um, we have to operate under the National School Lunch Program. Um, and they've, they've granted some of the waivers for the National School Lunch Program that um, were active for the summer program um, the non congregate feeding waiver, so we don't have to. Uh, um, so the students, um, we can feed the kids in, in the classrooms and um, And when students, if, if, uh, if you are picking up at the schools, then they don't have to Normally they have to eat the meals on site with a non congregate waiver, then they can pick up the meals and bring them back to their houses. Um, and parent and guardian pickup is allowed. So the students don't have to pick up the meals themselves. They just have to tell us the student's name um, because it's going to be, uh, it's not, uh, right now it's not free. So we'll have to identify like which students um, are getting meals and they'll have to be either charged or, uh, you know, uh, they're, Accounts will, you know, we'll have to like register that somehow. Um, so, um, for the fall, um, you know, our, our plan is uh, meals in the classrooms. There, uh, I mean, I'm not entirely sure about the numbers of kids in each class. Like, it'll be just the elementary schools initially, and then. Um, There'll be um, priority learners, I think, in either the middle school or the high school. I'm not sure um, which one yet, but so um, we'll have the kitchens open in each of the elementary schools and um, we'll kind of run the program the same way we've been doing um, our breakfast in the classroom pilot programs. So uh, we'll, um, we'll get an uh, account sheet from the teachers and they'll pack the meals into totes, um, which we're getting a uh, getting a uh, plastic uh, reusable totes um, with a clamshell. So, hoping that that's going to make it easier for the teachers to deal with um, any messes. Uh, when the kids are done, they can just put everything inside the container, um, plasticware, napkins, milk container, close it up. Um, put them back in the tote, put it outside, and the food service staff will come bring it back to the kitchen. Um, they'll clean and sanitize the totes. And then I think we're gonna, we're gonna provide breakfast at the end of the day um, for students since school is starting so late. Um, you know, we wanna try and get them the breakfast for the next day, the day before. So we'll get the same tally sheet from the teachers. We'll bring the um, totes back to the classrooms again, load it with breakfast, and when the, as students are leaving, they'll take their um, their breakfast for the next day. Possibly, we could do more than one day breakfast um, to make it easier. Um, but yeah, that's the plan. Um, Michael, I'm gonna can I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, because you've given an incredible amount of information, which I know is well appreciated by the committee. Um, so I just want to uh, pause for a second, uh, which is. Uh, Michael talked a little bit about what we've done, uh, the model that we might have to move to, if, you know, given the waiver is not extended, um, 
and, and that being an on-site pickup with um, confirmation and, and if students uh, aren't eligible for free lunch um, payment. Um, and then a little bit about the um, in-school model. Um, I wanna just transition, because I know you'll have a lot of questions to talk a little bit, if it's okay, Michael, about another option that we started exploring in the last couple of days uh, for fall, particularly for the for students who are attending school or families who are, have children attending school virtually. Uh, I'll be blunt that we know that having um, pickups at the school sites is gonna be much more challenging for families than having pickups uh, that is closer to home for many of our families. Uh, we know that um, it's gonna, we believe that it will eliminate some families from being able to access our food service program if they have to come to school each day, um, you know, especially for families with young children, families who don't have transportation readily available to them. So we're deeply, deeply concerned. Um, I wanna thank Doug Slaughter who came up with a really creative idea um, that has now been supported by the town. I talked to the town manager this afternoon as has, and, and you know, Mr. Gallo O'Connell's been in touch that it's, it, we could explore using some of the town's COVID funds, um, which expire at the end of this calendar year. So I wanna be really clear that they do not extend into 2021 um, to do a self-funded program um, to maintain uh, at least most of our sites or many of our sites within the community. Um, it would maintain um, certain aspects of that. The challenge is that we would not be being reimbursed for those meals and we'd have to rely on uh, the town's COVID funds to support those meals. So I think, you know, for our perspective, um, it's a very generous offer that the town of Amherst is willing to, to provide for us. And we know that that service is, is desperately needed by families. And, and I think because of that, the town has been incredibly generous in trying to work with us uh, on that would look like. Um, I don't know if Michael, you know, I, I gave an overview, if there's anything that you want to add about that one. And then I want to make sure that we're giving the committee a chance to ask questions in our follow-ups. Yeah, um, before I want to jump back into like, so um, the the uh, plan for um, pickups, like we have to have an option for remote learners. So the option is going to be um, using, I think three of the schools as pickup sites. Um, uh, the high school, Fort River and Crocker Farm. I think, I think the high school can cover um, the geographic area for Wildwood and the middle school because they're also close. Um, and I think that's probably going to be like an, an evening uh, pickup option. It'll be like a, a drive-through um, where there, you know, two people, two tables. First person checks which student they are, which school to go to, and then tells the next person how many meals they need, um, and they deliver the meals at the next uh, station. But like Mike said, that's going to leave out a number of people um, who either have a hard time getting to the sites when we're able to have them open or um, won't have uh, you know, access to a vehicle or a number of other reasons why they will, um, won't be able to get uh, to the schools. So, and the pickups would probably be, I think, you know, probably two or three days a week, um, depending on the demand that we initially saw. If it, was, if it was successful, we could, you know, offer the pickup more days, but the uh, other option I'm just talking about was the CARES, um, the CARES Act uh, money from the town would let us reach a lot more students. I mean, and it, in a way it's competing with ourselves a little bit because those meals we'd be giving out for free and the meals that we're giving out at the schools we'd be reimbursed for, but it's gonna be a lot more um, people that we're feeding. So I, I think that uh, yeah, that's worth the trade-off. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, we're thinking of running a program like what we're doing right now for the summer food program. So I'm thinking potentially eight sites that we would operate. Um, and the scheduling might be tricky. Um, you know, if it might not be able to happen during the, um, school meal period time for the remote learners. It might have to be um, either earlier or later, depending on like, I have to work that with transportation, like what they have available for the drivers and the vans, but um, it would be a driver and a volunteer and they would stop at a site for 20 minutes or half an hour, hand out the meals, move on to the next site. So we just, you'd notify people like, okay, this is happening at these locations. All the meals would be free. Um, 
we wouldn't have to track anything and uh, you know it would be the town that would be funding it so um you know it would also help us um keep more of our food service staff um you know, to give them more hours uh over the course of as we transition from you know right in the beginning we have more kids as remote learners and then we gradually trans you know transition towards december of a higher percentage of kids in school because once we have um access to the students when they're in school um even if it's like if it's one day then we can you know provide them with meals to go um so it'll it'll be easier for us to like you know provide the meals through the school lunch program um so yeah as we get closer towards you know full capacity for the schools the remote program would kind of wind down and we would have you know more um more need in the schools for uh for the, the meals so so i mean i think like the december timeline that they have the funding available works out pretty well for us um as long as um things progress like we're hoping for with the phased in models um because really it's just until even like that mid-november date where seven through twelve are back one day a week um once we have the kids you know that that have the more severe need um once we have access to them in the schools then we'll be able to give them meals to take home and even like you know get them more information about like make sure they know like okay these this is what the program we're doing and this is when the meals are available and um yeah i just think initially like is like, the start of school until mid-november is gonna be is gonna be challenging making sure that we're getting all the kids um food that need it um yeah so Mike, I I interrupt you just because um i think they're gonna have the committee's gonna have questions and um uh, so I want to just give the committee yeah. time, but thank you so much for a really thorough explanation of both what's been happening and then I second your notion of the staff and volunteers who have been doing just um, incredible amount of work around food scarcity. I mean, think of 100,000 meals. I hadn't heard that number before you said it tonight, Michael, and it is kind of shocking because that gets into the numbers that I know mathematically what they mean, but I can't really conceptualize what 100,000 meals are. Um, so yeah, deep appreciation for your leadership and for the work of uh, of everyone who's been involved. Um, but I want to just make sure the committee has an opportunity to ask uh, any questions because I think, you know, you and I talk a lot about this and it gets kind of weedy. Um, so I want to make sure the committee, if they have any questions that we might be uh, able to offer them an opportunity to ask. All right, great, thank you. Um, Mr. Demling and then Mr. Menino. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any real questions. Just to say that I, I think the uh, approach that you have is, is spot on. Um, I'm, I'm just really grateful for the, uh, the town of Amherst, to the town manager, and to the town council that has responsibility for overseeing the CARES Act funding. Um, you know, I, I've read stories of there are some real challenges that some towns have uh, with distributing the CARES Act funds and school districts that don't have enough money, um, e you know, even for their own um, to, uh, for school reopening for CARES Act funds. So the fact that uh, the town is willing to to go above and beyond to cover this, uh, in addition to everything else that they have to be responsible for, for the CARES the CARES Act needs to cover for other town services is incredibly generous. So I just, just really appreciate the generosity and the, the forward thinking on the part, part of the town. Um, I think trying to maximize, you know, um, all of the food um, meal services that we can provide to students, even if they're there one day a week, any any interaction we have with a student, you know, that when, if you can maximize the number of take home um, meals and, and, and information is, I think that's absolutely spot on. And the fact that we have, that we can sort of buy ourselves a little bit of time, that if worst case scenario, we still don't have any solution at the federal level, right, for January. And, 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 and we still have a number of students who are remote who need um, food services in January, then, then, what's, then what's going to be the approach then? You know, we have about four months to kind of figure it out. Right, and so, so what? What is the logistics? What's what's another, what's how can we get a little more creative about how to get uh, the meals? If, if if we can only re get the meals that we can be reimbursed for, how do we get that to 
to families, you know, um, you know, we'll have another four months to kind of figure it out this fall. Um, and so I, th I think that would be, that would be good. So um, I, I like what you're doing. I like the creative thinking. Thank you to the town of Amherst and, and thank you for the presentation. All right, thank you. Mr. Menino. I'd like to thank Michael for the wonderful work he does and let him know that he personally makes me feel very proud to be able to serve on this committee. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Gallo O'Connell? Yes, Ms. Kenny. Sorry, um, I, I did have one question. So I, I think I heard you say um, that the former summer food program was extended until September 16th because of later start at school. Um, but some of our, oh, most of our kids won't be back until October. That date got changed a little. So uh, will that just be the remote option for everyone at that point? And I also want to say I really appreciate um, you working so hard on all of this because, you know, not everybody has enough food all the time. And I, I just really appreciate it. And I also wanted to say I love that the leftovers are being repurposed and going to other people in the community that might not also, also might not have um, the same access to food. So I, I really appreciate that. I can just, the, oh, you want to speak to the September 16th to October 1st thing, Michael, or do you want me to, whatever you like? Yeah, I can, I can jump in there. Um, yeah, so that, like, they just extended those waivers for the summer food program a few days ago to extend until September 16th, because that was the problem we were facing for those first two weeks before school started. Now they've kind of moved it to the second two weeks of uh, October. Um, so it's going to be... Uh, meal site pickup at the schools um, for that time period. Um, and we'll just, I mean, over the last week or the next couple of weeks at the meal sites, we're going to try to like get the word out as much as we can that like, okay, you know, next week here are the locations where, you know, we can pick up meals. It's going to be at the schools instead. And hopefully we can get as many people as we can. And even if people, you know, if people are like working in, in, pods or cohorts, you know, they can come pick up the meals for like their pod or their street or, um, you know, for a number of people. So yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, it's going to be tricky. Uh, it's going to close a window um, for us, but, you know, we're going to try and do what we can do to, uh, to make sure that uh, people still get the meals. Yes, Ms. Stancer. Oh, sorry. Could I just um, add one oh. thing, Michael? Yeah, said. go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Morris, then Ms. Stancer. Sorry, I was late to unmute. So there is no accounting for whether districts are in person, hybrid, or remote as it relates to what happens once school starts. It's the date that the school year starts, the waiver ends. Um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. It's it's unrelated to the choice of schooling that occurs within a district. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Stancer. So um, I wanted to just make sure I have it straight. So with the waivers in place, we've been um, serving or providing meals for anyone who comes to pick up the meal. We haven't had a checkoff about what school you're in or anything like that. Is that correct? And so when those waivers go away, it's going to, and we don't have the town CARES funds it's going to be the case that only students enrolled will be able to get the meal? Or will anyone still be able to get the meal? Um, so uh, parents and guardians, to extend of that waiver, that, so the students don't have to come themselves to, to the meal sites, so parents or guardians can pick up the meals um, at, the, at the school pickup sites. Um, but we will, at that point, have to track um, who's getting the meals, and then it's going to have to, like, those numbers will have to go back to each individual school and the different districts to, like, keep those meals with the school um, that that student goes to. And it won't be, it won't be free meals. Um, so, yeah, uh, so we'll, 
that's a, another part that we'll have to deal with is, um, you know, I don't know if we'll have a lot of people that uh, aren't on free or reduced coming to the schools to pick up meals. Um, but if we do, either we'll have to make sure that we're charging their accounts or um, possibly deal with money at, at the at the uh, pickup site, but I'd rather not do that. So probably just charge the accounts um, and then try to deal with it in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mr. Gallo O'Connell. That was really helpful. I appreciate your work on this. Um, Okay, Dr. Morris, did you have anything else before we move on? No, okay. Um, all right, so next up are the um, policies that we had first discussed um, last week. So where, um, as Ms. McDonald explained, we do a first read and then come back and revisit. Um, and Ms. McDonald had emailed those around. So I guess going in order, the first one was um, BEDH, which is the public participation um do you like me to display this miss hall uh, oh do you have those i would love that if you could thank you um so the public participation that one um there were several changes made based on um the was the natick decision i i think that was yes natick decision and then also the changes for the um now more acceptable formats in which we will accept public comment. Um, so the version that's up on the screen now is um, there were no changes from the one um, last week. So this second read is really the same as the first one. Um, and so just wanted to see if folks have more questions, comments, further changes. Uh, yes, Mr. Menino. The third read will vote on the a policy? Well, that's up to the committees that we could vote tonight if folks are comfortable. If there's something, if there's any element that needs to be revisited, then we could. But if people feel okay with where we are, we can vote on these. Thank um, you. On one or all of them tonight. Yes, Ms. Lord. Um, I may be confusing myself from last week, but it says mail and email. Did we think that still having the voicemail was, um, were we going to keep that included? As oh, the, um, oh, it did. No, we did leave the voice message in there. Okay, maybe it's but yes, verbal probably. statement during an in-person meeting, a recorded voice voice message, or a written email message. Thank you. It's just yep. not in the second paragraph, so I was confused. Oh, okay. Understandable. Not hard. Uh, yes, Dr. Morris. Yeah, I think the second paragraph is more just a reminder that um, that those are public documents. Um, so that if you know, I I think that's the intent. It's actually a really interesting point that Ms. Lord raises, whether other forms of communication become public documents or public media, I guess documents is probably the wrong word. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, not that it necessarily needs to hold everything up tonight, but I think it's, it's really actually worth thinking about because in my opinion, probably all of that becomes public. Um, so, you know, I wonder if there's a, a way, you know, obviously this is your all decision, but to match the language in both sites, because I think we wouldn't want anyone to have the impression that a voice message is not a public media um whereas an email is um so i'm glad you found that miss lord yeah that is a good point i mean and as a practical matter the the voicemails come in and are transcribed so although they're not technically emails there is there is sort of a written version of them um so yes i I, I wonder know. if it's, you know, just says, oh, Mr. Denling has a hand up. I don't, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, wait, I heard Ms. McDonald, okay, Ms. McDonald and then Mr. Denling. Go ahead. 
um, if you can, if you can hear me, um, oh, I, wonder yeah. if, yes. <laughs> I wonder if it's a simple edit in that last sentence of the second paragraph that says uh, mail and email sent to the school committee members could just be voicemail, mail and email. I like that. That looks, sounds good to me. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I mean, so the, uh, I guess the, the wording isn't all that important to, to, to me. I, the, the only point I was going to, um, that occurred to me is that when the voicemail was played during the open meeting, it by, it by definition becomes part of the public record because it's played in the open meeting. It's the same, uh, in, it's the same um, effect as when you, you scroll the, the email during the public, um, public meeting. So basically anything that happens within the bounds of the open meeting becomes part of the public record. Um, I guess the only exception to that is if, if you had so much written email that you didn't, you weren't able to scroll it all in the time allotted and the chair decided that, that you were going to post the overflow somewhere else, then, then explicitly stating that any email that came in as part was going to be part of the public record. Um, I suppose it's also technically possible that you could get so much voicemail, um, that you could, that you could commit to posting it somewhere else, but you know, that would be, that would get technically maybe a little challenging. So <laughs> I get the only point I wanted to make is this, as long as you play it during the, during the meeting, it becomes part of the public record anyway. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I agree with that. And I also think that just adding voicemail to that last sentence, um, just makes it even that more, much more clear. Any other questions, comments on policy BEDH? Okay. Um, does anyone feel like making a motion from any committee? Oh, wait. I'll, oh, so Ms. McDonald, I can't do this part. I can't do your votes, can I? <laughs> I got, got a little little trigger happy here. Um, sorry. Would, would anyone from Pel I'm not taking over. Um, would anyone from Pelham like to make a motion? Oh, you're right. Sorry, Miss Kenny, go ahead. Do we have to make those edits first to include voicemail? I think you can make the motion as amended. So with the, the you know, adding the word voicemail. Okay, so like you, I you move, move to adopt the policy as amended. I move we accept policy BEDH for public participation at committee meetings as amended to include voicemail as public comment that was a great motion <laughs> second seconded by me now any further discussion all right we'll do a roll call vote uh miss kenny kenny aye mr menino menino aye miss barlow barlow aye uh miss dancer i can't well i can see your lips moving i'll count that i think No, I st okay. We have we have a nodding eye and hall eye. Um, all right, Chair McDonald, do you want me to pass this over to you? Um, I will try, but I might ask um, my uh, region vice chair to take over if if uh, folks can't hear me. Can you? Your can region you vice chair is having a little trouble with volume. So why don't we have the Amherst vice chair take the vote for, take the motion for the Amherst committee. Okay. Um, this is Peter Demling, Amherst vice chair. Uh, is there anyone from the Amherst school committee who would like to make a motion? I move that the Amherst committee approve policy DEDH as amended. Lord second. All right, moved by Spitzer, seconded by Lord. Is there any further discussion on the motion for the Amherst School Committee? 
Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. And I am not as organized to do this alphabetically, so I'm just going to go around as I see you, and we'll start with Ms. McDonald. McDonald, aye. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. And Demling, aye. It passes 5-0. Uh, Ms. McDonald, do you want me to proceed with the region? Um, or can folks wanna... hear me or no? What's that? Can you hear me or no? Yes. Yeah, you, I can no. hear you. You want to go uh, for it? Yeah. Um, so I, I move to approve policy BEDH for the region um, as amended. Second. Moved by McDonald, second by, was that Spitzer? Yes. Yep. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer. <laughs> and McDonald's aye. The motion passes um, eight to zero. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Morris, would you mind pulling up um, EBC supplemental, please? If you have it. You are on mute. Can you say that one again? I'm sorry. Sorry, you... EBC supplemental. That's the, the longer one that covers a bunch of different policies. It was a, the Word document. EBC FA? Uh, we could do that one first. Okay. That one, I, I'm, yeah, that'd be easier for me at the moment. Yeah, okay. That one. Up in a second. Yeah. Um, okay, so EBC FA is the face coverings policy. The only change um, that we made from the first read last week was that instead of it just going away, um, the school committee would need to vote to rescind this policy when, when that's deemed necessary. But other than that, um, everything in here is, um, is the same. So any, any questions, comments, follow up on EBC FA? Mr. Demling. Um, Dr. Morris, did we get Ms. Consolino? Uh, did, did she happen to take a look at this? We had, we had uh, discussed that last time. Yeah, so I think we looked at it in terms of mass breaks and other things like that. Um, she, she's developing her own kind of our local procedures as we would based on policy, given the proximity to the start of the school year, um, took a look at something I believe yesterday that she put together uh, around this. Um, so we feel good moving forward. Anything else on face covering policy? No? Um, okay, I will make a motion from Pelham. I move to adopt policy EBC FA on face coverings. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Kenny. Any further discussion? All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer. Nodding aye from Ms. Stancer. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. All right. Mr. Demling, do you want to do this for Amherst? Sure. Um, for the Amherst School Committee, uh, is there a motion? Does anyone want to make a motion for the Amherst School Committee? Or I will make a motion. Um, I move to approve policy EBCFA face coverings for the Amherst School Committee. Lord second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Lord. Uh, is there any discussion? I guess I'll just make a quick note for the public since this is a 
topic of active discussion at like kind of the detailed implementation level, but we're discussing policy, which is a higher level than the low, lower level detailed implementation. And I would certainly expect this to come up in periodically in terms of um, superintendent's update. Um, we had talked about lower level things like um, masks and gaiters and that kind of level thing. And um, as we hear more from our nurse manager and whatnot, um, it's an active detailed level topic I would expect to come up with the fall a lot. Um, but this is one of those higher level policy um, guideline documents. That's the only sort of framing I want to put on that. Any further discussion on um, face covering policy? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Uh, Ms. McDonald. McDonald, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. And Demling, aye. That is 5-0 at the Amherst Law. Swing it over to you, Ms. McDonald. Okay, I will try uh, to uh, manage for the region. Um, I'll make the motion. I move to approve the policy EBC FA face coverings for the region. Is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by McDonald, second by Spitzer. We'll do a roll call vote. Um, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Dancer. Dancer, aye. And McDonald, aye. It passes, the motion passes eight to zero. All right, thank you. Um, so then the last one is um, EBC supplemental. So this one was the general policy on COVID related issues. Um, so instead of a, it being its own standalone policy, it just calls out the COVID related changes to existing policies. Um, and this one, similar to the face coverings, um, policy, the only change we made on this one um, was to have it, we would, the school committee would need to vote to rescind this policy um, instead of it just any of it going away automatically. Um, and, and also just to reiterate Mr. Demling's point. Um, oh, and there's the, the change highlighted. Um, that these, you know, as policies, they are just more general and there will be a lot more specificity when it comes to the implementation of the policies at the, at the school and district level. Um, so any questions, comments, further edits on um, EBC supplemental? Yes, Ms. Spitzer. Sorry, I apologize because I wasn't here on, on Thursday, but I'm wondering for that first bullet that's promote public safety and safety of students and faculty, if we shouldn't also include staff, just recognizing that there are people in our buildings who aren't faculty, unless that term, mm -hmm. generally I think of that term is just including teachers. I believe that's there. You, what do you think it, well, can you scroll up to the top? Okay. So just that very first bullet? Yeah, because it just is of students and faculty. I'm sure our intent was everybody in the buildings. Mm -hmm. So it would read of, of students, faculty, and staff? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's my suggestion. Yep. Any, anyone have any objections to adding staff there? Okay. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments, edits? Um, okay, I don't see any. Um, all right, would someone from Pelham like to make a motion on EBC supplemental um, as amended, adding the word staff? I 
I'm happy to make a motion for the region. Yeah, get us going, Ms. Spitzer. Okay. Um, I move that the Regional School Committee approve policy EBC supplemental creation of a general interim policy on COVID related issues as amended. Second. Moved by Spitzer, seconded by Harrington. I need further discussion. Seeing none, we'll move to a roll call vote. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes eight to zero. All right, thank you. Mr. Demling, you want to take it away for Amherst? Sure. I move to approve policy EBC supplemental creation of a general interim policy on COVID related issues as amended for the Amherst School Committee. Second. Seconded by Spitzer. Is there any further discussion for the Amherst School Committee? Seeing none, we will move to a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Uh, Ms. McDonald. McDonald, aye. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. And Demling, aye. Passes 5 0. All right. Thank you. Very good. Um, all right. I move to adopt policy EBC supplemental creation of a general interim policy on COVID related issues as amended for the Pelham School Committee. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, honestly, you got to do it again. I have no idea who got it first. <laughs> Let's. <do it. laughs> All right, Ron, you're the only one unmuted. Is there a second? Second. There we go. Ruined by all, seconded by Menino. Any further discussion? Thank goodness. Okay. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. And Hall, aye. The motion passes unanimously for Pelham as well. Um, okay, next up is the fall 2020 update. I will pass things back to you, Dr. Morris. Sure, so I have kind of um, two things that I'd like to share and uh, they're, they're both a little lengthy. Um, I guess the, the, that phrase means different things to different people. They're just not like one sentence ones. But um, so uh, the first is just a little update on distance learning. We talked about that recently. I wanna thank the APA for working together in agreement that'll guarantee high quality synchronous instruction for every student every day. Uh, that's something that, you know, uh, we definitely heard the feedback last spring. when We did the surveys of families, staff and students uh, was a huge need uh, at every grade level from our youngest students to our, to our graduating seniors how important that was. Uh, we're now in the process of developing uh, more formal schedules. We got some feedback from what was presented last time. Um, by Friday, all principals will be sending home draft schedules, at least the kind of the middle school, high school, they're a little more formed. The elementary, we're taking that feedback in uh, and we'll be able to share with families at least blocks of time during the day where uh, live instruction will occur because we know that that's really important for families, start time, end time, so they can do some planning. Uh, we'll be then looking and getting feedback from staff at grade level schedules. Um, so about a week later, uh, before Labor Day, we'll have the grade level schedule that'll be more individualized for, for, for students. Um, at the secondary level, we'll be able to share, um, you know, the, the kind of model schedules by Friday. Um, and I think um, we're looking at, in that email, we'll have when student schedules, like student registration process and when actual individual student schedules Will be uh, will be available, uh, which will be a couple of days before the academic year starts. Given that they're transitioning, scheduling all the students into new schedules at both the middle school, high school, and Summit Academy. Um, I want to be really clear about a couple of things on the elementary side. Uh, one is that 
Um, there'll be a visual schedule offered for every family. Uh, we know that uh, for students, we want to build their independence and for students at the elementary level, not just having what we would think of as a schedule as adults, but we wanna have a visual schedule to support them, uh, to support their independence. I think the second thing is that there'll be live uh, synchronous instruction every single day um, across our content areas, our, our key areas. Um, I think another thing is that it'll be aligned between schools. So the same expectations, you know, for our four elementary schools, we, we hear that feedback. We know that that was not the case last spring and, and we're working hard and we appreciate partnering again with our, our, our association who agrees that we want to make sure that it's a, a better experience for our students. Um, I think um, there was a, I think some of the, the original schedule had probably too much detail. Like if we're going to do it again, we probably would put less detail on because I think for instance, some people assume there was a transition from an asynchronous lesson to a synchronous follow-up. And really it would be like similar to what we just did here where it could be a video that is shown of a mini lesson and then very quickly that screen sharing turns off and then the follow-up happens. So we are very conscious for elementary students that we don't wanna have a tremendous number of transitions. There will likely be two significant blocks of instruction a day. Uh, there'll be a pretty wide uh, middle where there's a lunch recess time. And part of that is for teacher prep, teacher collaboration. But part of that actually is the food service piece that, that Mr. Gallo O'Connell talked about before. Uh, because we will, we are planning on having food sites in our community. We need enough time where no elementary school student needs to miss a lesson because they're going out to get food that happened last spring. And we're trying to be much more organized and aligned so that uh, having access to food uh, doesn't conflict with having access to instruction. You know, and that's our goal. So uh, you, you'll likely see, and we're working this out with the food service staff this morning, uh, a, a long period in the middle of the day for uh, lunch recess and some um, you know, independent work. Um, we are focused on academic subjects as well as social emotional learning. Um, and, you know, we're continuing to do that. So by Friday, uh, principals will be emailing out uh, at least you know, rough schedules with kind of when blocks of time will happen. Uh, and then a week later at the elementary level, the full schedule by grade level and probably about the 13th or so at the high school summit, a little bit earlier at the middle school, the student schedules to be available. But that, the emails that will go out by the weekend, will have all those details uh, about here's where we are and here's where you'll get your final schedule because we know our families are, are interested. Um, another thing that we are doing a little different last year is we'll use Google Classroom for grades 3 to 12. Uh, at the K to 2 level, we're using a program called Seesaw which is a similar uh, model to Google Classroom, but it's designed for younger students. So it promotes more independence and more capacity for students to be in charge. You know, for instance, has icons. If you're a student who's an emerging reader, you don't need to read as much to navigate the site. Um, many districts use it actually for all their elementary schools. We're gonna do K to two. We feel like at age three, grade three rather, uh, we're able to use Google Classroom effectively. Um, so, you know, that is something uh, important. Uh, in addition, for some of the independent work times, we are we have purchased uh, with some of our COVID funds um, reading and math programs um, that are much more self-sufficient. So instead of kind of families feeling like they need to create additional assignments for some of the independent blocks, uh, we, these programs have been vetted by our staff. They're high quality uh, and easily navigable uh, navigable um, programs that supplement uh, the in-person learning. You know, at the elementary levels, for sure, I think anywhere, we don't want to have six students on screens for six hours that we, you know, especially doing live instruction. But for students who do want to have more, you know, independent work, uh, we want to have that uh, available uh, for students. I think um, uh, another update is that uh, next week or the week after, yeah, next week, uh, starting the 31st is when staff report back. That includes teachers and paraeducators. And our, at pre-K to 12, they'll all have high quality professional development on distance learning. Um, I think I talked before, we're, we're using GOA, which is, um, which is a school, uh, distance learning school, um, an international school that does that. They do professional learning, uh, professional development for schools. Um, I've taken a course, Mr. Sheehan's taken a course, or all of our elementary principals have taken a course. Uh, we've been incredibly impressed with what we see. I think most valuable uh, has been that the elementary principals immediately saw the connections around equity, about student engagement from their school improvement plan to the professional development they received, which I guess in theory was really about distance learning, but they were able to see the through lines to what our district values as well. Um, so we really were excited to see that. Uh, it's something that uh, I was really glad they had an eye to do. Um, it's gonna look a little different at the secondary and elementary, but all paraeducators and all professional staff will have uh, a lot of professional development next week uh, to really ground them in best practices in distance learning. Um, you know, the elementaries 
Uh, we'll have two additional sessions. One's about how to humanize online spaces. It's true for, it's important for everyone, but particularly for elementary staff, thinking about how spaces like this can feel a little different than spaces like this, frankly, uh, for working with young children is really important. And the second is how to transition online or in-person learning or in-person planning to online uh, education. So we feel really good about the, where we're going. Uh, we're also going to be planning some uh, family and caregiver professional development as well to support families and, and caregivers because it's going to be a mix uh, to support them in that way. So I think, you know, for families who are advocating for more live instruction, more structure, a daily schedule that's reliable and dependable, um, I think they'll be pleased with what they see in the next two weeks uh, as those plans get formalized. I think in terms of the professional development, I think people will be pleased with uh, a higher quality product. And, and that's on us. Last year was an emergency. Uh, we did a lot of training on the technology and the tools. We did not do as much training on the pedagogy. There just frankly wasn't time uh, and capacity it, it, at that point of the pandemic. At this point, we're being much more planful. We have distance learning coaches at the secondary level, at the elementary level. Those are current staff members. We have one in each district, one in Pelham, one in Amherst, and one in the region, uh, who part of their job in the fall is going to be to support their colleagues. Um, so we have all the PD we're doing, but we want to have ongoing professional development and support. So these are, these are um, wonderful, outstanding teachers uh, who are stepping forward to be able to support their colleagues. So I think the structures are really different uh, for what we're how we're able to support staff. Um, I do hear from staff uh, very frequently, you know, this high engagement in improving their practice. Our summer programs indicated that our staff who, who participated in teaching those programs had a lot higher success rate. And a major focus is, continues to be how do we get students in small groups? Because what we know about online education uh, and it's right on, you know, GOA's website is if you have 15, 20 students in a room, uh, it means one person like me in this case is doing a lot of talking. And when you can break that number down, that really engenders broader conversation, much more so than in-person learning. Um, and particularly at the elementary level, not exclusively, particularly, we want the majority of our synchronous instruction happening in a small group context. And, and we, we believe that'll make a huge difference from what people, um, how students and families um, understood and experienced the spring. Uh, and uh, by no means are these comments meant to indicate that uh, I don't have a full belief that online education um, is, or excuse me, in-person education uh, far exceeds online education in terms of the value uh, for educating for students for social emotional functioning. I've said that since June 3rd or whenever that first presentation was. Nothing has changed my mind on that topic. And we know we're gonna have students starting the year and throughout the year, either by choice or by public health uh, situation who are gonna be in a remote learning environment. And we feel obligated, I feel obligated and dedicated that it's a markedly different experience than what, what, what our students and families and staff experienced last fall in terms of ongoing support, training, uh, and, and final product in terms of learning, which is why we're all here. Um, so I was a little long-winded, but I did. I, I think it's important for folks to know um, what we're doing, how we're working, um, and, and that we still have work to do. That, you know, I'd love to have a plan that was neat and perfect to present to Unite on every detail. And, and, you know, be honest, we're not there. And we're not there because we're trying to be thoughtful uh, and learning from some places, frankly, that have started this year, uh, like, you know, a district I spoke to um, in the southern part of the United States, where they had one hour of synchronous calls for, you know, at the elementary level every day for every kid in large groups, and, and they're backtracking, because what they've, ex what they've found out is, you know, that wasn't an effective mechanism to engage students. So we are trying to be thoughtful in that way, and, and you know, our principals are working. I met with elementary folks, for instance, secondary folks yesterday, elementary folks yesterday and secondary, uh, yesterday and today. Uh, people are working incredibly hard um, trying to make the best uh, situation for our students, trying to understand the developmental differences between uh, age levels as well. So I, I have one other whole different um, update to offer on fall 2020, but that was a mouthful, so I want to, or an earful in your case. So wanted to stop and, and see if there's any questions on that, and then I can um, talk a bit about another topic. All right, sure. Uh, Mr. Menino. I have two questions. I'm a little dense. Uh, is there going to be in-classroom um, uh, instruction uh, on October 1st? Yeah, so that, that is our current plan. We do need to continue to negotiate that with the um, association, uh, with actually multiple bargaining units, um, the APEA, um, AFSME, UFCW, and the APAA, which is our, our small but um, still important administrators union. So those conversations are ongoing, and that would be the aim. 
Um, and that, that's sincerely my hope. Then my second question is uh, it, for Pelham, if, a stu if there's gonna be in-class instruction and a student uh, opts for distant learning, they will not have a Pelham teacher as an instructor? So I think we've talked about this in the past meetings, but I don't think maybe I've been clear enough. Um, my understanding from the committees is that um, there was a comfort level of Amherst, Ele Union 26, which is the Amherst Elementary Schools and the Pelham Elementary School, uh, working together to make sure all students received high quality instruction, regardless of whether they're in person or virtual. I think for schools like Pelham that have one teacher per grade level, um, it forces a choice that either, if they weren't collaborating with Amherst, then we have to get into multi multi-age, multi-grade, oh yeah, multi-age classrooms uh, or multi-grade classrooms, which there was not so warm feelings about when we talked about it earlier this summer. Um, so I think that kind of collaboration is really important. We have got our tier one numbers in, we're still analyzing them. There's still a couple we're still reaching out to, families we're reaching out to. Uh, but even this, one of the meetings this afternoon was looking about what are our numbers in school, what are our numbers out of school at our four elementary schools? Uh, and how do we guarantee that we have a teacher uh, from one of those two districts or from Union 26 to support them uh, and virtual. You know, we're not taking the step that districts like surrounding districts, neighboring districts are taking where they're uh, buying into uh, online platform that doesn't, that involves teachers that are not on the site. We're guaranteeing it's our teachers teaching. Uh, and that's about as much as I can guarantee for, uh, for that because otherwise you highlight that, um, you know, I mean, a couple of districts, and I've said this, actually, we've had this conversation, Mr. Moody, you know, that, you know, some districts in the Midwest are coming off, like putting a video camera in the back of a room. Yeah. And yeah, it just, it, it doesn't make any sense. There was a, a big outcry, um, made a lot of national news, actually, um, just because it was the plan. They thought it would work, and it just doesn't. I think Boston is still playing for the camera in the back of the room. Mr. Demling. Um, on distance learning, um, so there was a question about um, minimum amount of synchronous time uh, for distance learning that might vary per grade. Uh, are, are you able to comment on that at this time, or is that something that you want to wait until future meeting to to comment on? Uh, from a student perspective, you mean? Yeah, um, there have been there has been question and comment about and concern slash concern about. Um, will there be, should there be a minimum amount of synchronous time for students um, uh, for synchronous instruction? Uh, and and, and that, that might vary per grade. Um, and, um, and that might be a discussion that's currently happening. I don't, I don't want to get into something that you might not be comfortable. Oh, no, um, I'm not. I just wanted to cut the bone afterwards, but I just um, oh. didn't know if that's something that you were, could comment on now. Yeah, absolutely. So the reason I cut the question a little differently is that if we are breaking to small groups, there's going to be a difference between staff synchronous time and student synchronous time. So that's why I asked the, that question to distinguish those two, because um, they're going to be different. Um, so in terms of students, we are looking at a range of, of synchronous times. I think the big thing that, that I feel strongly about and our team does is that every day there's um, a synchronous component to the kind of three core areas, math, literacy, and then unit study. Uh, as well as one synchronous session that's on social emotional. Uh, what we find at the elementary level is once you get a little beyond half an hour, um, that starts getting in one session, that starts getting to be a little bit of a challenge for students. Um, and, you know, sixth graders better able to handle longer stretches than first grade students um, in general. So I think that's probably what, 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 where I am or where we are in terms of sharing. Uh, again, you know, on Friday, we'll share out just kind of general blocks of time. It's also going to range, and the reason I'm, I'm not hedging, but just wanting to be, uh, that it's going to range based on the individual student. So some students, for instance, are going to receive uh, synchronous um, occupational therapy or speech therapy, um, some special education services, some ELL services. Some students may be taking an instrumental music lesson uh, that would be ha that would occur synchronously. So there's some range that isn't just about the grade level span. Some of range is about individual student um, and and options they have. Uh, and we also have to talk about specials because we still are obligated as we should be to teach the arts, the computer, right? All those other really important uh, whole child activities that we value so much in our community. Um, so, I mean, I think the short story is you add it up and, and you're talking not about minutes, but, you know, um, you know, beyond an hour. Um, and I think probably considerably so. Um, and again, I think for our, our vantage point, if we can do that in small groups, we know that our students can manage that a lot better. 
once we start doing lots of whole group lessons, we believe that it will be less effective. So I'll come back probably next week or the week after with a bit more information, but I, I hopefully that gives at least enough for now. All right. Any more questions for Dr. Morris before part two of the fall 2020 update? All right, Dr. Morris, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, so last week, um, on Friday, uh, as you all know, I think I forwarded Desi, uh, our state um, governing board put out a set of uh, guidance that uh, requested that educators who are teaching virtually do so from their school building, you know, perhaps bringing their children or others with them if they need to, to do that. Um, you know, I just want to say publicly and respectfully, I disagree with that request. Um, I think you just heard me and I'll say again, I'm deeply committed to virtual teaching being substantially improved since last spring. However, I don't believe mandating a physical location for educators to complete, where mandating a physical location uh, where educators would complete that task correlates with the quality of education that our students will receive. You know, we want to be committed to opening our school buildings for educators who would like to provide high quality distance learning from our sites. There's going to be a lot of good reasons people want to do that, whether that's um, technology, having computer with, you know, wired internet access or high, high quality Wi-Fi. Uh, it may be that, you know, the mat instructional materials people have, I've heard from some, particularly from some science teachers that they really value, will value being in their classrooms to do distance learning uh, because of the physical parts that are, are there um, that are hard to simulate in a home environment. Um, but I want to be clear that, you know, my perspective is we should not be mandating that they, they do that. Um, there's so many complications that people are managing. Um, and having all staff have to be in buildings. If you think about all of our staff, not all of our staff have a classroom to go to. Our paraeducators um, work in classrooms, but they don't have, most of them don't have a classroom of their own. Um, and, you know, it just, it feels uh, respectfully, you know, not something that we would want to do. And simply put, our focus, our primary focus is on supporting educators with skills and development they need to perform at a high level, not on their physical location. And so, you know, I just wanted to be really clear with the community and with the committee and then our staff, which I'll follow up in an email tomorrow on this topic that, you know, our eyes on the prize, our prize is high quality distance learning. Um, really for me, stress, causing stress on where that happens for staff members and frankly, causing a significant amount of stress on our custodial crew um, and, uh, and parenting uh, for families uh, who are teaching um, can be much better done for some in the home environment if they have high quality access to internet and, and other supports there. So, you know, while I appreciate DESE's um, trying to um, support districts, I think in this case, it, it, created, um, it created a problem we weren't trying to solve uh, in terms of mandating location. Uh, we wanna make sure we're open to that. We know that there are staff members without access to high quality um, technology and Wi-Fi. We absolutely want to open our doors for them if they think that's the best in work environment. Um, but to force people out of their work environment, it creates a, a logjam of HR issues. There are some families, some some staff members who can't return to work, you know, in the environment. It, it, it creates layers upon layers of complications where really we want to be laser focused on pedagogy, relationships, and student agency, uh, and not on these kind of other tangential items. So. I didn't want it to come as a surprise to the committee or the community or staff that that's my feelings on the topic. I'll follow up with them in an email tomorrow. But you know, really, there are incredible number of distractions in our world right now, in schools, in planning, uh, in life, and this is a distraction that is, you know, for for us, you know, our administrative team, we don't feel like is actually going to help up promote what we want to have, which is the best product possible for our kids. Uh, we feel like it's actually going to distract from that focus. So sorry, it's long-winded, but I, this one I was really surprised by and, and frankly a little taken aback by um, this guidance. And, you know, um, I just wanted to be really clear on my, how I view that one. All right. Thank you. Any, any questions or anything else for Dr. Morris? Mr. Demling. Um, so as to that update, thank you for saying that. Um, I mean, I don't think you would probably be surprised if we went around the horn that there's probably a lot of support for that sentiment that you just expressed. <laughs> I mean, I think we've been, I think we've been pretty comfortable pushing back on the state when they have ridiculous ideas about the fall. Um, I mean, just speaking for myself, there should be good reasons for doing what we're doing, and there should be there should be compelling reasons for the education of students. And if it's not improving, 
the distance learning instruction, then 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 why why do it, right? So so thank you for that. Um, I, I I guess I guess given the date and given given the news and given the public comment, I I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, uh, is there anything else that you can share with the public and the community about either the timeline for a final complete um, uh, picture of the fall? Uh, or any other details you can provide about the fall. If your answer is no, things are still in process. Uh, you'll have to wait. I understand. <laughs> um, as a, a representative of the public, I, it's just my job to ask you. So <laughs> that's that's the only reason I ask. Sure. So uh, I think my response is that we are meeting quite frequently. We being the negotiating team, which includes Ms. Lord, Ms. Kenny, uh, as well as Ms. Cunningham and uh, Ms. Ortiz, um, we're meeting frequently with the with our bargaining units, both in formal negotiation and bargaining sessions. We've had some success breaking into smaller um, groups to like work groups to try to uh, expedite the pace. Um, and that's been really a successful model, including even today where we had a, a work group um, that met to try to expedite the pace. We are aware, I think, I. I feel awkward speaking for bargaining units, but I think there's a collective feeling that we're trying to work towards resolution as soon as we can uh, and try to resolve differences as soon as we can. Um, so the answer to your question is no. And like, I don't have a, a, a finite or definite uh, point at which we'll reach resolution, but I do believe that everyone is doing their best to try to work on this as expeditiously as, expeditiously as possible. Um, you know, I know Mr. Harrington is also uh, on the negotiating group for UFCW, which is one of our other bargaining groups. Um, I don't know if they have anything to add um, or disagreement, which is fine if there's divergent viewpoints, but that, that's my belief. Anything else for Dr. Morris? No? Okay. Um, all right, thank you for that. Um, all right, next up is future agenda planning. Um, so I guess I will pose this more as a question. What, I guess, Dr. Morris or Ms. McDonald or anyone on the committee, what, what would we need to meet about next? Yeah, Dr. Morris? So uh, one topic that's region specific is that athletics. Um, so next week, I'd like to put that on the agenda because we are we're starting in a remote start at the secondary level. Um, it is a school committee vote whether we can have athletics in the fall season. I have touched, um, Ms. Stewart, our athletic director, and I have been in touch with the Amherst Health Department as well as Ms. Consolino um, about their views uh, on athletics. There are not all sports are allowed to be played in Massachusetts. For instance, football has been pushed off fall. I think it would start in February potentially, um, but there are sports all except one, uh, volleyball. Uh, our outdoor sports, volleyball is the only indoor sport, and they are, uh, there are modifications to the sports. Um, so uh, I know there's a lot of interest, I, at least I've received a lot of interest in this particular issue. Um, so that is something that at least the regional school committee would need to come back and, and potentially take a vote on next week. I know Ms. Stewart could come and uh, update you all on what's happening at the other schools. Um, she meets with the athletic directors uh, locally with some frequency, as well as uh, where we are in terms of coaches and, and student athletes. Um, but that, that's something that is pressing that um, hopefully we could meet, you know, perhaps a week from Tuesday, a week from tonight, excuse me, um, to move on. I mean, I think there's general fall updates that will continue um, to like Mr. Demling's question, both about um, the schedule, but also about um, where are we with an update on, uh, are we closer to kind of resolution? Um, those two seem like their topics uh, we need to meet about. I'm certainly open to any others. I know we will have a policy review of um, the new Title IX uh, requirements that you know, our staff have been trained on, but our, uh, some of our harassment policies based on um, rule changes at the federal level will need some adjustment um, as well. Um, but I'm open to other topics. Those were the ones that seemed they're on the top of my head. All right. Any other committee members have topics. Okay. Oh, yeah, Ms. Spitzer. Well, just that we're going to need to um, relate it to an item on our agenda 
we're starting the superintendent evaluation process. And so I think that needs to be built into the schedule as we move forward for the region in Amherst. Mm -hmm. I don't know about. Okay. Going, I, I, um, on Thursday, Ms. Stancer um, presented a, a proposed timeline and um, I think we were looking at um, two weeks from now would be when um, when the submission would be due from the, the actual submission of the instrument from committee members would be due in two weeks from now. And then a week after that would be when we would meet as a committee to, to discuss that. So three weeks from now. Okay, but so, but still the meeting next week though, that would be region only on athletics and then potentially a joint portion of that with um, uh, more general fall updates. Okay, is there, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Morris. Nope, I'm good. Was there a time frame for the athletics conversation? Should we try to, oh wait, no, today's Tuesday, it's not Thursday, so we could, we could do that a week from today? Okay? Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Um, warrant report, I was advised to skip this, given the time. Does anyone have an objection to that? No? Okay. Gifts, there are no gifts, I believe, right. Okay. Um, I move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee meeting. Second. All right, moved by Hall, seconded by Menino. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, it's aye. Uh, Ms. Barlow? Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. Um, Peter, do you want to take care of um, Amherst? Sorry, Mr. Demley. Uh, they have another oh, item on their agenda. We have a, oh, right. You guys aren't even adjourning. Oh, right. Sorry. Okay. Good night. Sorry. Seriously. Try not to be too jealous. <laughs> Great. Can folks hear me? Okay. So, yes, we have um, another one more item for both the Amherst Committee and the Region Committee, um, which is the superintendent evaluation. Um, and in our packet are the one pagers uh, uh, prepared by Dr. Morris for each of the each of the districts um, on his goals. And Dr. Morris, would you like to give a quick guided tour of the documents or? Sure. Yeah. Tried to get them on one page, but didn't want to mess around with the font and make it tiny to literally be on one page. So I went a little over. Um, but the the um, it's the last four pages, I think, of the packet. So the first one is the Amherst goals. Um, what I chose to do on most of them is have very short um, text uh, in italics and then a couple links to the actual artifact documents. So the first goal in Amherst was around um, the early childhood education. The second was on the capital plan. Uh, which actually just typed out the projects that were completed and which ones are done comp done, and which ones are partial, uh, as well as the capital plan document. The third goal is about school improvement plans. We heard an update on Crocker Farms. The other two were scheduled, uh, I think, on the 17th of March, uh, which did not occur, but I think I'm able to describe some of them. Uh, the fourth is about Comenantes and the, the review. Um, so that is posted. Um, as well as a document about how it was integrated into the, the entire school environment. And the last one is a wellness goal on the LGBTQ plus students and families um, and vaping education. So you can see some links to some of the work there. Similarly at the region, you know, the, the wellness goal included some more topics, um, like especially mental health. Um, so I included a little more there. Um, the sixth grade, you know, the interim report, which is not fully completed all except the executive summary is there. Um, uh, in terms of diversity of staff and HR um, and PD, I included some links there. And again, strategic planning, much like at the elementary level, is curtailed given the end of the school year. Um, but I tried to give, uh, follow the directives that I heard or allowances, however you want to say it, from the school committee of trying to just focus on uh, pretty small amounts of, of content 
um, for each given the situation. So hopefully it's sufficient. I think if any committee member has any questions um, about either what they read or what they didn't read, or you know, they can definitely be in touch with me individually, but I tried to follow the kind of process that was laid out um, to support the committee members to complete the evaluation process. And hopefully this matched what we talked about. Great. I, I personally actually really, I thought these were really comprehensive one pagers. So <laughs> very in depth. Any um, comments or questions? Um, I just, because we've been having ongoing conversations, want to reiterate, like, I, I think this looks very useful. So um, we have two weeks now to independently read through the links. And I just want to confirm, we, we voted on, on the um, instruments previously. I will ask, I'm assuming, Sasha to, to actually send that instrument out to the full committees, and then right. she'll be in email. Is that, I just wanted to confirm that because this is the first time I've, I've been in this role. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that that's you're exactly right. So um, we'll just ask um, Sasha to email the the instrument out to each committee member for each district of which they're a member. Um, and two weeks with the due date of two weeks from tonight, whatever that date is, September something. It's the eighth. Thank you. Any other questions? None. Okay. Great. Can I make a motion? I move to adjourn the uh, Amherst School Committee. Lord second. Uh, moved by Spitzer, second by Lord. And there's no discussion on that. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The Amherst Committee is adjourned. Mr. Denman. I move to adjourn the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Second. Um, moved by Demling, second by Stancer, I believe. Kenny. Kenny. Kenny, sorry, thank you. <laughs> moved by Demling, second by Kenny, and there is no discussion. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And I want to apologize for my in and out on the audio tonight. I've been using the phone, and after a while, it decides it doesn't want to do it anymore. So, my apologies. <laughs> no need. I'm, I'm the biggest coupler. Um, Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The region is adjourned. And thank you, everybody, for stepping in and helping tonight. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Enjoy your vacation. Take care. Good night.